Amen. It's good to see you this morning. I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God's design for His people is to have a breakthrough in all of the areas. There mustn't be an area in your life where you're struggling. You're supposed to have a breakthrough, and especially, more especially, if you have been following Jesus for a long time now, then you're supposed to have had a breakthrough in every area of your life. And if you're struggling this morning, let's find out where you're struggling and why you're struggling. When you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, financial prosperity becomes unavoidable, inevitable. Now, I am not talking about the prosperity doctrine this morning. No, we're not dealing with the prosperity doctrine. I'm talking about being healthy, wealthy, and whole. Amen. For too long, too many Christians are struggling. You can't make ends meet. And you might just blame it with the present situation in our country, in the world. With the virus that attacks so many people, not just physically, but because of the physical setback, they lost everything. Some of them lost their houses, cars, no jobs because of that. We can't blame it to that, yes. But when you have set your life hard and fast following Jesus Christ and following his principles, his word is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what do you do with that? I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. I will be there to the very end. I'm not saying that uh, we're immune to this disease. No, I'm not saying that. There are lots of precious Christians that have died and gone on. What do you do with that? What do you say about that? Well, God is still in control. Nothing the devil can do and say about you that he doesn't know. And nothing the devil can do or say with you without him authorizing it. So even if you lost precious loved ones, he knows about it. So, God has all of this said. Why? This is because the kingdom of God's prosperity is common. As children of God, prosperity is common. That you do have prosperity. Now, you might argue about it this morning. You might become a bit more, you know, a bit too religious about it. And you want to fuss about what are you are talking about. Then if you don't believe that money is important in our lives, then don't go to work tomorrow. And if your boss wants to know what happened, I didn't see you the whole week last week. That means this week it's going by. You can tell him. I don't need money. I can do without it. Money is part of our lives. Right at the very outset, money was there. They used money for trading, used money to buy, to sell. They used money. So why is it now that we've come to a place of saying, no, we don't need it? You see, our passion, our focus, and pursuit, worship and honor must be Toward the giver and not the gift. The author of prosperity is the giver who is God. So don't take your focus of God and uh, project it on the gift. You see, a lot of people today, when they started, they started well. They dedicated their lives to the giver. They focused on the giver. They worshipped the giver. They bowed down to the giver. And everything was the giver. Until you started finding some money. Until money started becoming bigger in your life. Then your focus was changed or shifted. So no more it is the giver, it is the gift. Whoever you are this morning, 
you started well and you were well off and now you you are saying i don't know what has gone wrong i will tell you what has gone wrong it's not hard to decipher this to find out where the problem is the problem is your focus has been shifted from the giver to the gift i have a problem with that you know even among our circles of people and friends you see you see a fellow battling and struggling you see a girl battling and struggling and then you tell her hey i've got a good job for you i've got a good opening for you go there and tell them i sent you they know me and they will take you because of my recommendation they'll accept you and you go then you start to work boy you had nothing and suddenly you're somebody you're sitting behind the desk and you're commanding things in this big company and you got everything and we meet down the road some day and just a high and carry on you don't even stop you don't even ask can we sit over a cup of tea perhaps we can just chat a little bit i want to thank you and appreciate what you've done no i'm not here to sit and wait for your appreciation i'm not just sitting here and waiting that you might thank me but at least have that attitude of being grateful have that attitude of being grateful so you will find a job what i'm getting to is we forget the giver and we focus on the gift so make sure the giver is still first and foremost in your life because god wants to unleash its abundant wealth into your life provided you start pursuing the right source money is not a miracle I heard people testify. Mm. I had nothing. I didn't have a house. I didn't have this that and the other boy. I came into money. What a miracle. And now I have every everything. I want to make it clear with you money is not the miracle. It is merely a reward for your seeking again your right focus who is the giver. So don't ever make money to be the miracle. The heathen out there must know when they see you, you're not bowing down to the money, you're bowing down to the giver of the money. You're bowing down to the giver who is in heaven. God understands how important finance or financial freedom will be in your life, in your family, perhaps in your ministry. You know when you testify and you tell about the goodness of God you must stand up straight you must look good you know testimony from somebody who who doesn't look what the testimony really is doesn't balance doesn't make sense so before people listen to you they must see who you are they must see what you have they must see how you are constructed they must see that you are somebody to listen to so make sure we come to a place of getting what god wants us to be so god understands that we need these finances but we must firstly trust in faith and faithfulness therefore instead of pursuing money begin to pursue god he is your source of every good thing so this morning your difficulty is money your difficulty is a lot of other things but pursue you got this morning go back to where you first started when you look at yourself when you first started the love that you had for god how you started was very different to what you are and what you have now because we take too many things for granted and because we take too many things for granted we are where we are Psalms 84:11 says for the Lord God is a sun and a shield the Lord God will give grace and glory no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly that's quite a thing isn't it no good thing i don't care what it is put money into the category whatever it might be no good thing will he withhold from those who love him that is his word 
So what's your problem this morning? Why are you suffering? Why are you struggling? Why you can't make it? What is? And according to His Word, whatever you are after is good. Nobody is looking for anything bad. None of us want to go after anything bad. Everything that we want to go for is good. And if it is good, and you are God's person, you are God's people, then He's not going to withhold this from you. That's what He says. David says in Psalms, no good thing will he withhold from those who love him. So, keeping that in focus, let's find out how we can unleash some of these things that have become a dilemma in our lives, which is really God-ordained breakthroughs. Why? Let's find out. Firstly, know that God is your source. You must understand that he is your source for every need. including finance keep that right know that god is your source and nobody and nothing else it is not your friend it's not the job it's not the company that you started it's not anything else but god just take god out of the equation and you'll find yourself in trouble don't dare say well i can do without god that's what the guys with the titanic said when they built that great ship and this is bigger we're sailing it now and when they had the meeting they said the people around that board that were sitting they said look this ship will never sink and they went as far as to dare to say even god can't sink it god can't sink it that's why on its maiden voyage that was 1912 i think on its maiden voyage it went down thousands of people lost their lives don't ever get to a place of saying i've done this and i've done that i've done it to the best of my expertise i i engineered the old thing and nothing can break it all god is there so don't take god out of the equation deuteronomy 18 818 says but thou shalt remember the lord thy god for it is he that giveth the power to get wealth what are you going to do with that verse especially you fanatics that that you cringe a little bit when you talk about money i mean if you're sitting here this morning you talk about money I, I, you know I, what are you cringing about what's the problem right here it says he giveth the power to get wealth You're doing well in your business, Jason. He gave you the power to do well. And when you talk about doing well, what does it boil down to? What are you saying? Well, I'm getting money. My bank balance is growing. I can do more things now than I've done before. And that's what he says. Power to get well. That he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto thy fathers, talking about Abraham that's what he said to Abraham Abraham I want to bless you I want to bless you and make you a nation a great nation exceedingly great nation my quiet an adjective that is exceedingly great and that's what he's done because Abraham followed him in every aspect of his life he laid down his life literally almost he did it and uh, god blessed him and then here deuteronomy tells us just as he promised your forefathers you're going to get it too and then verse 19 says and it shall be if thou do at all forget the lord thy god and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them I testify against you this day that he shall perish or surely perish. So God has a standard set. He hasn't left anything that he's giving to us, a promise to us without any order set. He says, you do this and I'll do that for you. You don't do this, then well, you'll know. that I'm ups- upset with you that's what he says there you dare forget the lord your god 
after he starts blessing you, then you're going to have it. Is that the problem with a lot of people today? And they don't know. They're saying, I don't know what happened. Well, here it is right in the word of God. Isaiah 48, 17 says, Thus saith the Lord, listen to this, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. He says, I am the Lord, thy God, which teacheth thee to profit. Did you know that, that God is a teacher of how you can become profitable? That's what yeah, he says in Isaiah. I am the Lord your God, and I am the God which will teach. I am teaching you to profit. Now, when we talk about profit, the only thing that goes to our mind, because the subject I'm dealing with this morning is prosperity, which has to deal with partly finance, but not really altogether finance. When you talk about God wants to teach us to profit, he's not only talking about as your mind runs to finance, only to profit and finance. In every area of your life, God wants you to profit. God wants you to profit. And uh, if you're taking up uh, some job, let's say you want to become a hairdresser. I know there are experts around that will train you and make you to become the hairdresser you want to be. But he's the one who will bring you to the place of profiting. That you become the addresser. Or whatever other sphere in life you want to pursue. He says, I am the Lord which teacheth thee to profit. And as you start profiting, make sure you don't profit out of the weak people in this world. Don't use the weak people around you and use them as your subject matter to make you profit. Be careful. And he says, I will teach you to profit and profit the right way, which leads thee the way that thou shouldest go. I will teach you to profit and profit and to go the way I've set for you to go. That's what he's saying here. And verse 18 says, Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. I wish you had listened. That's what God is saying. I told you all of these things, and I just wish you had listened. If you listen, then thy peace would have been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Wow. I never saw that before. My peace will be like a river. That's what it says. If you listen to me, if you had listened to me, that's what he, the word says, then you would have had peace like a river. Peace is total well-being, prosperity and security associated with God's presence among his people. You're not going to have peace drips and drabs, you know. One day you have peace, the next day you've got misery. One day you're calm and the next day your life is terrible. Well, let's go back and see. You'll have peace like a river. He's not talking about a river under some terrible storm where a miserable storm came by and this river is kind of a bursting its banks and all the debris is flow, flow, flowing down. And Is that the river he's talking about? Oh, no. He's talking about a river that you sit beside where it flows cool and calm, serene, tranquil. Talk about a river where you can, you can practically stand there and see fishes swimming. Have you ever been past that river? Is your life like that river? Or what kind of a river does your life project this morning? And he says, if you had listened to me, your life would have been as a river. And your righteousness, my listen to this, and your righteousness as the waves of the sea. And also the sea, a stormy sea, a terribly boisterous sea, which almost capsizing the boats and the ships and people are, are dying. Or like a tsunami? Is that a righteousness that you project? He's talking about a sea, a beautiful sea, where the waves continuously roll, come to shore and go back. There's no stopping. From ever since I was a little boy to now, that sea is carry on rolling, Jason. Did you know that? The sea doesn't go to sleep. And it rolls and it rolls and it rolls. Beautiful. Why? 
Why do you think people uh, out of Durban area, and especially people that don't live on the coast, come down to the coast during their holidays? Now you take it for granted. Some of you haven't gone to the beach. You don't know where the beach is. You don't know where the sea is. People pay a lot of money to come down here to, to enjoy what we've got. And they enjoy the sea. And God is talking about your righteousness will be like the sea and the waves. What kind of a righteousness do you project this morning? Righteousness is right standing with God. Righteousness is upright as you walk in the ways of God. And that's what it's talking about. Righteousness is the established establishment of a right relationship primarily with God and his people. Firstly, your righteousness must be established with him. And then his people. It's no good only being heaven conscious and your over religious praying, fasting, reading and everything else, but your neighbor knows you as a witch hunt. You're, a, you know, some terrible person. Your righteousness must be seen all around. People all around you must see and know that you are an upright person. That's what he says. Your righteousness as a sea. Therefore, righteousness denotes fulfilled expectations in relationships all around. Righteousness is careful that you don't become unjust in any situation in your life, upright in every area, whether it's in church, at home, business, wherever you are, you are upright. You're serving God with absolute righteousness. Then you have to also believe that God delights in your wealth, prosperity. God is happy in your prosperity. That's good to know that. Not everybody is happy when you're well. No. Especially your friends that have known you. If they change, you'll, you better believe it. They're not happy about where you're going to. But here, God, it says, delights in your prosperity. Unless you believe that God wants you to prosper financially, you cannot activate your faith for it. You want to activate your faith for this, what God has for you? Then you better believe it. God delights in this in your life. Psalms 112, 1 to 3 says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generations of the upright shall call him blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Now this is the word of God. Listen to what he says. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth, referring, it, referring this to you and me. Your seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generations of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in your house. And his righteousness endureth forever. Why aren't we having this? Why aren't we experiencing this? This kind of a wealth and happiness in our homes. Why? It's time we became practical in our Christianity. It's, it's time that we started really Using God's word. Job, Job 36, 11 says, If they obey, the, uh, obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity. Now this is not Job speaking. Job was, oh, he had a terrible time. And you heard the message a few weeks ago when Maran did about Job, where his three friends came and harassed him. And while they were trying to find out Job what the problem is, and Job tried to, you know, contest this whole thing and carried on. And finally, in verse, 
chapter 36, Elihu comes in, the fourth guy speaks up. Being the youngest fellow of the whole lot. Now, he was a very fine young man, this Elihu. He respected the other three fellows who were much older than him. And he waited. When the time and the opportune time came, he started speaking. And this is what Elihu had to say. Listen to what he says. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. Now this is Elihu, like a prophet, came in and started talking to Job and those three comforters. And listen to the word he brought to them. If you obey and serve him, you will spend your days in prosperity and years in pleasure. Was he wrong? No. You would, have, you would have found out by now if you carried on listening that Job became twice as rich and twice as lot. Oh no, same lot of children, but he became twice as rich. And uh, that's exactly Eli's word. Now that wasn't only for Job. It is for everybody that follows down from Abraham. That's what God says. Otherwise, you're going to die by the sword and you're going to die not only without profiting, without knowledge. You would have died a fool. Psalms 35, 27. And the Lord be magnified which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. There's nothing wrong when you, you have prosperity and you know how to handle it. And you know what this is all about. This is part of God's plan and purpose in your life. When you know that right, you will go a long way. There are many men around the world that are very prosperous people and blessing his kingdom. So make sure you know what to do, how to do. Then make God your greatest passion in life. You really want to be blessed in every area of your life? Then make God... Your greatest passion in life. God is our passion, reason for living, not money. Let me remind you again. God is the reason for my living and not money. When you prioritize God, he will prioritize your provisions. Is that true? Well, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things including money all these things shall be added unto you so make sure you prioritize this right seeking God and his kingdom first you run after anything else you're going to fail you're going to definitely fail but when you put God first and seek him and his kingdom so God is not just a church you're playing church. You know, like you play house, you're not playing church. It's a reality of a relationship with God. So here he says, make sure that is okay. Isaiah 119 says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you're willing and obedient and you follow its commands, you will eat the good of the land. Your cupboards will be full. Become a passionate sower. I'm going to close with that. It is a divine principle. When you release what you have in your hands, God will release what is in his hands. It's a principle set out. You release what you've got and God will release what he has. Luke 6, 38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. This is a new living translation. 
You give to God and he'll give back to you. You don't give him, well, obviously, you're not going to get back. So the principle is give and you will receive. And how will you receive this? He says, when you give, it'll come back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. My, I try to figure that out. What is this all about? He will give, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God is a way of giving more than you've given many times. Now, I find that when you buy a packaged with a cereal that's powderish like, you know, and a cream, a milk cream. Uh, on the can, it'll say, product has settled. When you open the can, you'll find it's not as full as you expected it to be. It's all down. As if the, the manufacturer gave you half a can instead of a full can. The product has settled on transit. You know, it, that's the way it goes. Now, if I was doing it, for me, myself, that is, I'll make sure it'll settle down well and put some more. Settle it again and keep putting some more until it's full. What am I doing? I'm pressing it down. I'm pressing it down. I'm shaking it. Now, I, I, I do that. We, 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 we have, uh, like, conflicts that we buy. And when you open a big box and it sits there because so many other cereal that we, I have different cereal, different uh, mornings. So when you got conflict sitting there for too long, it start picking a bit soggy. So to avoid that, we have big jars, bottles, and I try to put it into those bottles. So we got two bottles. So one big box of conflicts, it's a problem to get into two bottles unless you take something like this and put it in and it won't be conflicts anymore it won't be conflicts anymore but i don't do that i shake the bottle i shake it i knock it and pour all the conflicts in that's exactly what he's he's talking about here when you give to me it will come back pressed down shaken together and running over you won't get a miserly bit in your pocket. He'll give you so much so that you'll become a blessing to others also. That's the plan of God. To bless you that you become a blessing. So here he says, when you give, I will give back to you. Your willingness to give is a continuous test of your true or your trust in God. When you give, it's a test is seen, openly seen, of your trust to this God that you serve. So you got to do this. You got to have it done all the time. Your willingness to give freely confirms that God is in your trust or you trust him and not money. Step up your giving commitment. If you want to see a bit of a change in your lifestyle and you want to be a little more comfortable in serving God in every area of your life, then this is what you need to do then. Step up your giving commitment. Do you realize during this COVID season that uh, lots of Christians have found it convenient not to commit to God anymore in that area. Oh, they come to church, all right. You see them very Christian-like all the time. Oh, yes, you see all that. But when you look at their pockets in transition with God's, there's nothing happening. So, it, it is somehow settled in our minds. Well, I'm not going to church. For some people that are not going to church anymore, well, I don't have to give. Well, the mentality we had, listen to me very openly and clearly, please. The mentality perhaps you had is you're paying the preacher. You're paying the pastor. You're paying indirectly, yes, you're taking care of this place.
but you're not paying for anything. Your giving is between you and God. If you had that set right, then you wouldn't have changed and stopped in your giving. Even when the church was closed, you would have still saved what belonged to God and sent it. You would, you would have found a way of getting it to the church. Am I right, Jason? You mean Jason all the time, you're Jason. I, I don't know how to do this. I, I'm just using an example here, please. Jason, I don't know how to do this. I, I, uh, church is closed and I've got the money to give to God and, and they're not, not collecting offerings here anymore because we've got to be careful. So is it possible I can send it over to you? You can transfer the money. Find out from another friend in church. Can you transfer this money for me, please? A trustworthy person. Not a fly by night. Somebody who's come to church today and won't be here for a long time. Especially after you give him 10,000 rands put in the church account, you won't see him for 10 years. So be careful. So find out there are ways. Let me ask you a question. How many of you didn't pay your furniture account? You stopped paying and you're still living. You haven't paid your mortgage and you're carrying on. Really? Wow. You're not filling any petrol in your vehicle, but you're still running. It's running. Boy, amazing. That might sound funny, I know. How much more funny you think it is to God when you tell him, I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't have the opportunity. What are you talking about? So make a fresh commitment this morning between you and God. The reason for your stuck in your financial situation and even if you're progressing, even if you didn't do what I'm talking about, and you are just running in mind, you, you're saying, I don't agree with what you're saying, minister. I, I, uh, you know, I didn't follow these things, but I'm doing great. Really? Give it a little more time, then come back to me. If you have taken your focus off the gift, uh, off the giver to the gift, then you're heading for disaster. Believe me, move. Your focus from the, from the gift back to the giver. God gave it to you and expects it back the way he gave it to you. Your life. When he gave you your life, you gave it to you innocent. You were a baby. You were a newborn. Didn't know between right and wrong. Innocent little life. He gave it to you that way. And as you grew into this world of all kinds of contamination, you became a part of it. So you need to come back. You need to tell him, Lord, I'm sorry for becoming wayward. This morning I repent of my waywardness. I want to get back to where you want me to be. Let me close with this this morning. In case this morning you're becoming arrogant in your heart and saying, you know, what are you talking about? Malachi, after talking about bringing all your tithes and offering into the house of the Lord. He says, bring it into the house of the Lord. And uh, after saying all that good things about what can, God can do in your life when you bring your money into him or into his house, he'll open the windows of heaven to you, for you. Not the windows of heaven for the church, for you in particular. He'll open the windows of heaven. Pour out a blessing upon your life there won't be room enough to contain it. What a promise. How many of us are living that kind of a life? He is blessing and there's no room to contain what he's doing. The goodness of God, not only finance, in every area. I just can't contain it. I'll have to give it out. I'll have to tell people. How many of us are living that kind of a life? Is it just the word written? What about the word becoming alive in our, li in our hearts, in our lives? And then finally, he says in that verse 13, for people that have arrogant attitude, you have said terrible things about me. God is saying this, not me. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. And you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? 
don't we try to jump and defend and uh, argue this thing? What did I say wrong? Where did I say it? You have said, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying His commands or trying to show that the Lord is in heaven? What's the use? Did you come to the place, especially during this time of this terrible season that we're in, what's the use of serving God? What's the use of going to church? What's the use of anything like this? Did you ever get to that place? You know, when you get to that place, then, especially you, husbands and wives, you spouses, you'd rather be careful of your husband or your wife. One of these days, they'll turn on you. She or he will turn on you. After all these years, oh, by the way, we'll be 50 years married soon. And uh, we hired a little uh, bed and breakfast place in Shell Cross for the 50th anniversary. So it's going to be great. So in case you're getting, think I'm a serious, I'm a little bit serious and not so much. But the seriousness is 50 years together, 50 years with the church, 50 years with the marriage. And can you imagine after 50 years of marriage that you're still not settled with the spouse of yours? That's the exact same thing I find with people, with you and God. You haven't settled yourself with God yet. God cannot trust you. One of these days, you are his spouse. Remember that? You're the bride of Christ. So, he can't trust you. One of these days, because that's what he says here. You have said the terrible things about me. What's the use of serving you? What's the use of living in this life? I'd rather just pack it up and call it a day. And if that's the way you are with God, that's the way you're going to be with your spouse too. Be careful. If I were your spouse, I'll be, I'll think twice about it when you're going to turn on me. So our relationship with God must be intact. Flawless. Nothing must come in between. Make sure we found our place in God and doing it right. It's not the building today. Yes, there's a good work on those buildings and if you're finding out what's happening, I've heard all that I need to hear and I'm trying to build and still cracks and, you know, building is falling and what's happening. Well, get a little more foundation into it. Foundation is making the giver the first and foremost and not the gift. Let's stand this morning and make that adjustment then. Tell him, Lord, I, I realize this morning I, I did take my focus off you and um, put it on other trivialities of life and uh, I, I I need to be for, forgiven and the only way you can get forgiven is asking him directly Lord I'm sorry for what I've done I'm sorry to have turned my back on you I'm sorry Lord this morning I turn to you with everything that I have and if you're here this morning, especially in the area of your finance with God, you tell him this morning, Lord, I have neglected that area. Maybe I, I, I did, but I didn't do it altogether right. And perhaps you are here this morning saying, Lord, I did nothing. I took a break. I thought everything is fine. But now I realize the commitment I made still stands. I'm going to find a way of doing it right. Excuse is not good. I'm going to find a way of putting those wrongs right. So just lift up your hands and tell him, Lord, I'm here this morning. Please forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I want to get my life in order with you. And I believe you have a miracle for me. And the miracle is not finance. The miracle, Lord, is the gift of your love in my life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, this morning, as we stand together, Lord, we make that commitment afresh. Yes, we are sorry for our negligence. We are sorry, O oh God, for 
thinking that we can overlook this. We're sorry, Lord, for making it little. We're sorry, Lord, for making it unimportant when so many other things have become top priority in our lives and the things of God suffered lack. This morning, we lift up our hands to you and letting you know that we are sorry. Please forgive us. We confess this morning, not only to our wrongs, but affirm this morning that we will begin again. Our names to be rewritten in the Lamb's book of life. There will come a day when you tell us, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So this morning, Lord, on those areas, definitely, it will be our wrong and our sin. Forgive us this morning, wash us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every saint that is standing here this morning, we even pray for those that are not here, O God, undertake for them. Our prayer for every child of yours, every member of the church, cover them. Even those that are not well this morning, we are believing you for divine touch over their lives. But for those that have been affected with the virus, Lord, divinely cover them. Break the yoke of bondage. Break the yoke that has come upon them. Set them free. Divine healing will be their order. So cover us all this morning. And thank you again for your love over our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hi again and good morning. Great this morning to have been in the house of the Lord and it was good to have seen all of you. And uh, I believe, yes, God wants to bless us and bless us to, to great levels. So this morning, if you listen to the word or catch it again, like they call it, find out what God wants you to do and where He wants you to do it. And when you follow His precepts, you're bound to be blessed. So this morning, I wish you well and your family. Will